This is episode 242 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Control and Compound Financial. They teach real estate investors how to multiply their wealth using infinite banking strategies. For a complimentary wealth coaching session or to learn more, visit www.controlandcompound.com forward slash Andrew Hines. Welcome back to the show. Today, I have my Thava on and he has uh, never been on this show, but I've been on his show. He's got the uh, Rise podcast with Austin Ye. And he is a very aggressive real estate investor investing in Toronto, Windsor, Sudbury, Kirkland Lake, and New Brunswick. Uh, Those are just a a few that he mentioned on the show. And uh, he's also active in the mortgage business. Uh, Very, very interesting business-minded guy with a chartered accountant background, uh, having graduated from uh, Laurier and their business program. So um, yeah, we had a great talk. We talked macroeconomics. We talked uh, the future of investing in Canada. And... um, timely discussion because I think a lot of people are wondering, you know, what direction should I go? Um, How do I need to pivot? Uh, We did talk a lot about that, the need to pivot. Uh, And just because something worked a year ago or two years ago doesn't mean it still works. So that's stuff to keep in mind. And uh, I thought it was a very, uh, a very interesting discussion and I enjoyed it. Uh, So before we get into that, I just wanted to remind you that we host the GTA West REI meetup. Please make sure you're in the Facebook group so you can find out about the next one where you can meet and network with like-minded investors. It's completely free to attend. Uh, We just ask that you support the venue and make sure that you RSVP on the individual events uh, so that we have an idea of how many people are coming and we can let the venue know. And uh, as always, I want to ask you to please support this podcast by sharing it with somebody. Hit the like, subscribe, notification bell, do all those things that help get this out there uh, because that's how we grow. Uh, That's how I can continue to bring you this content uh, and all these great guests. So if you could do that, I'd really appreciate it. And without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the episode with Mayu Thaba. Hello and welcome to the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. I've got Mayu Thaba on this show. I said it right? Yeah. Yeah, Mayu, Mayu, Mayu. I get everything. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I did my best. What do you What do you prefer to go? Mayu. Mayu. Okay. Mayu. All right. Well, I got yeah. it. I got it then. Um, thanks for thanks yeah. for coming down. For sure. Anytime. It's I think yeah. it's long overdue. <laughs> you, hit, you hit that traffic on the way. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah. We were driving right across the four hundred one. Then <laughs> I've become uh, I don't know repulsed by driving. I don't uh, I don't really do it. I, I like a nice open road. Yeah. <laughs> Going ninety. <laughs> I spend way too much time on the road. I, 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 yeah, the open roads though, like going to Windsor, Sudbury. I'm all right with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just don't like stop and go. Yeah. Honestly, Any okay. traffic at all. I 407 it, so I'm complaining about the small yeah. stretch of 401 <laughs> between the 407 and here. And yeah, so. you're all right. You're all right. Um, <laughs> yeah, man. So what's going on? I uh, I actually don't know your your uh, story? investing story, so this will be fresh for me. So you wanna you wanna give yeah. me the scoop of I'll give everyone the your rundown. background? Yeah, give me your background. I bought my first property right out of undergrad, but like that was a completely different like time and stuff like that, right? So I almost, I don't really talk about it too much, but to give everyone the context, 2015 graduated. I was going to say 2015. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It was a a condo, pre-construction, knew nothing about real estate, living at home, had no real expenses, just monthly grind, save, put it into Mm. the project, right? That was about a year and a half. Uh, my, My girlfriend then, now wife, bought a property at the same time. Same thing with Terrace. She lived at home, saved money, put the, put it down there. Mm-hmm. And then 2017, bought the second property. That was at the peak of the 2017 market. Got burned bad on that one. Um, that was like right before the stress test and everything mm-hmm. kind of came in. Uh, so then you kind of start to, and then I had a non-payment of rent on my wife's property and then non-payment of rent on my property. And you just kind of realize there's got to be a, like a more scalable method to this thing. Yeah. Right? Because if you just, these are big mortgages, like five, 600K, single tenant, it's fine when you only have three properties because mm-hmm. two properties and we're both still living at home, not married yet. Uh, you can kind of like float the bills, right? But if you kind of keep scaling this, adding one property every single year, the non-payment of rent exposure is a huge risk for your portfolio, mm-hmm. right? Especially if you're doing it in like single families and stuff like that. Man, Ontario, that's yeah. like two biggest risks to Ontario is yep. is that and the five-year mortgage, which is also a, a risk for the rest of Canada. Canada. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, but like, look, so... so that was 2018. We got married in 2019. I got laid off in 2018 as well. And that's when I was also dealing with non-payment of rent. So it all just kind of like hit me at the same time. Yeah. Like, okay. Like there, I like the real estate thing, but there's gotta be a better way to do this. Quickly got employed again, went back to my previous employer before that, did a bunch of shit. Um, but that's when I, I went out to the London limo tours at McKeever and then we're doing back then. Yeah. The Weibo limo yeah, tour. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
I went to that one. That was great. And then I went to uh, an investor meetup. And I went to this investor meetup and Austin was running Rise back then. It was like his second meetup. Um, everyone there was like talking about Windsor. Back when he was doing it at the REC it was like, it was office? Like, yeah. It was just, yeah, it was before REC. It was like, oh, before uh, that? Okay. It was a bar. It was literally the very second event. Okay. Um, and I went and everyone's talking about Windsor. And so they all thought like what I had with the, my three properties in the GTA was like, cool. I thought what they were up to in like Windsor was like, that shit's crazy because they were buying at like 150K, renting yeah. out for like 1800. I'm like, these numbers are like hard to mess with. And like, if you've got multiple tenants and stuff like that, if one doesn't pay you rent, you're kind of covered, right? That was the logic. Yeah. And then I didn't know anything about Windsor. Um, I partnered up with Austin. I funded his, I think it was his second project or something like that. Um, and that's how we started getting acquainted, right? And then we just bought up a bunch of properties in Windsor together. Um, and that was like right into the 2020, like the dip of the market. Got caught in the middle of COVID with like a couple purchases. I think we had like three townhouses, another set of three, a duplex, all kind of closing that like first one and a half months where you had to wait outside the bank for like two mm-hmm. hours to like get any money, right? That got caught up in that, but came out of that. And I just went, I'm just going to buy like a bunch of this shit because like it's crazy. I've got my proof of concept. We'd already done like one or two mm-hmm. burrs. And that was my thing. I just wanted proof of concept. And as soon as I knew that it worked, I was like, now I'm yeah. just going to go crazy with it. But everybody who was doing that in, in Windsor shifted gears to like Sudbury and stuff. Yeah, that was, yeah. Not was, everybody, but it feels like yeah. everybody. Yeah. So we yeah. stopped 2020 September, I think was the last property we bought in Windsor. And by that point, we'd already purchased like, I don't know, like 10 or 15 like properties. We just kind of went crazy. The flip or burr? Burr. You still have them? Uh, no. Sold them all? <laughs> no, no, no. I still have, I have maybe like seven or eight units in Windsor now still. Okay. Right. So, but we sold off like a good chunk within the last 12 months and we'll talk about that as well. Um, but yeah, you're right. Like at that point, at the end of 2020, Windsor started stopping to make, like it just didn't make sense. Um, and a good chunk of people went to Sudbury. The entire reason I stopped doing Windsor um, was A, my exposure to Windsor was getting significant. So I, I believe like 15 units in a given market is more than like what I'm comfortable with. Like that's a good number to kind of For stop For you right at, now, yeah. Right. And this then, is your um, full-time gig as an investor? No, no, I was still working. I still had like my big, like I was, I'm a CA by trade. I still have my license. Uh, I was working at Ernst & Young on okay. the audit side. Um, and this was just the, the side hustle and it was becoming too much. So yeah. then 2020 May, I switched into the Auditor General of Ontario just to kind of like, I was like, okay, I just need to chill nine to five. Cause like the big four audit life is like mm-hmm. the nine to nine grind and like stuff like that. Right. So switched into the Auditor General and, um, People were moving to Sudbury because it was better cash flow numbers. But my entire thing was that was a time around where the government was saying, you know, if you don't have to pay rent, if you if you can't pay rent, don't pay rent. <laughs> I was like, well, that's that's just not going to sit well with me because it comes down to like risk control, right? And it's just like, yeah. what, like what's your risk reward? So I went out to New Brunswick at that time. We bought a, a seven unit and an eight unit. And I think this was before like the mad rush that kind of came into New Brunswick. I just literally Googled where is like there's no rent control because um, I was interested in commercial multifamily, but I realized in Ontario rent control is also another issue and like where where can you evict at like a reasonable rate and like obviously the u.s was big for that kind of stuff but alberta and new brunswick was popping up mm-hmm. alberta wasn't too happy with like the oil and gas exposure and i kind of had heard the stories of like the ups and downs that kind of happens in that markets quite a bit new brunswick was still a little bit more like it's not that there was ups and downs it just kind of never went up right so well, it's been a stagnant <laughs> market until recently yeah till recently agree yeah. right so but i was okay with stagnant i just didn't want the down now What's your take on this? Because people who are from New Brunswick have got an opinion on it. Jake was just out there and he's like, wow, you know, PEI was beautiful. He did a motorcycle tour and he's like, yeah. New Brunswick, on the other hand, like there, there's some rough parts. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there's some rough parts. Um, we have one eightplex in Moncton um, and we have a sevenplex in St. John's. Um, both aren't necessarily like in the rougher parts of town. And I still have not never been to New Brunswick. Um but never it comes in, bought but never been. Yeah, bought but never I been. F- I hear that more and more these days. I mean, it's kind of the age we live in, but it's it's still an odd concept to me in a way. I think New Brunswick, they're used to out of town, out of province. Yeah, you just, days. so how did you make the decision to buy? Somebody um, else go out for you? Yeah, inspect, inspection. So like the realtors there are, they were using the, uh, what do you call those cameras that like shows you like every single thing. That, like, oh, the kinda, Matterport? Yeah, they were using mm-hmm. that like well before I feel like a lot of realtors here were even using it, right? Um, and then the property managers are like well equipped with like a strategic renovations. Like I don't even need to tell them like, Hey, like, don't do this. Don't do that. A, a unit will turn over and we'll have it like redone for like four or five grand. Yeah. Um, right? which is the way it should be. But so is this your focus now? The new Brunswick thing? Nope. <laughs> no, you're pretty much <laughs> so, done. Well, so yeah, new Brunswick, through, I got to 15 and you then, got to 15 and then you're like, that's enough there. Yeah. And then, so yeah. I, I ended up leaving my job in 2021. Uh, yeah. 2021. 
And I, I kind of went into, I was just going to do private lending. That was my thought process. I was mm -hmm. flipping a little bit at that time. Um, and then I got my mortgage license more so in my head, I was just going to private lend, but I wanted to be able to do full due diligence on like an applicant when it came in. Right. And then I ended up doing mortgages for a lot of like other investors. Um, and that business honestly just started to take off, which I'm you know, very grateful for. But the result is that you don't really have a lot of time to spend on your own investing. I'm mm -hmm. sure you've kind of experienced ups and downs. Well, you got to build a like, little team around you, right? Exactly, it's a constant thing, man. Until that happens that you're kind of like just drowning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> drowning. Like it's enough to make you hate it, right? Yeah, and that yeah. sort of happened for me because yeah. I used to do mortgages. And then I got to the administrative side of it made yeah. me hate it. Yeah. Um, sure. And if, if I knew what I know now, I probably would have just stuck with it. I would have grown that business. But I, I had to like hit the wall a few times yeah. and realize that I was not willing to delegate and I screwed myself. Yeah, fair. Man, the amount of things, like I look at what I know now and the wisdom I have now, and I'm not saying like I'm the smartest guy or anything, but just like the experiences I have now, if only I could talk to my 20 year old self and just, and just <laughs> give me a good slap too. in the head and say, you're going to start young. You're going <laughs> to, you're going to do it right. Yeah. 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 I think, I, I think the, like, honestly, the mortgage business for me, it's, it's the pride. Like it's, it's what I love doing now. Mm -hmm. Um, it's you get the adrenaline rush on everyone's transactions. Like you see, you know, every time we close, yeah, you get like to a see. Deal, you know what the cool thing is, right? like with the network now, <laughs> like it'd be a whole new world. Like you're just like you're you're working with investors, people in your network. Like the network I have yeah. now. If I said I was doing mortgages again, I could you know probably crank it on. Um, yeah. And and I would yeah, you get to see all the deals, get right into the numbers, and I mean I get to do that on this show anyway, but it's yeah. it's fun. Like yeah, yeah I, I like looking at deals, and you get to see what's working because you're actually seeing real time who's transacting. Yeah, and, and honestly, so for me, like when I got into the mortgage world, it was very much I'm, I'm coming from a CA background. You're more analytical. Like a lot of like the, the competition was not, and I was I was coaching as well, right? So I'd have people come in, they, they've got like one, two, maybe three properties. And it's like, how do we get you into like 10 units? How do we like scale you up a little bit? Mm -hmm. Right, and just kind of like, it, it was it was yeah. advice beyond just pure like, here's like the rate, here's like the lender and whatever. It's oh, like, hey, yeah. let's structure your portfolio. Yeah, because way, you're right? able to think bigger picture. And, you, and you've been yeah. through it on like multiple purchases and like stuff like that, right? And like, yeah. So do you, did you do business school like, yeah. as your undergrad? undergrad at Laurier? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so you, you come in with that perspective of business and real estate, which I do too, yeah. uh, which in my coaching business is big. And I know you yeah. were, we are talking off camera, like for you when you're doing coaching also big, like just, just being able to coaching, see, yeah. think business strategy. So, yeah. um, I consider myself more a business builder today than a real estate portfolio builder, yeah. but both utilize the same skill set. Yep. No, and, I think, and I'll continue to back, you know, build an asset based uh, portfolio. Yeah. Uh, but it's just, I, I like thinking bigger picture. And sometimes you do need to pivot. Yeah. And especially in Ontario right now, like building asset based profile uh, portfolio is certainly a challenge, yeah. which is why I'm doing stuff in the US. And, you know, I think every real estate yeah. investor has like one arm. Like if you look at real estate investors as a whole, you find normally they're either there's a contractor, which is like yeah. you're gonna save money on the contract. A realtor. <laughs> a realtor or a wholesaler. Yeah, the, the really money. active ones are their their active business is related to their investing. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it, that's a wonderful compliment. There's so many people out there that that do, you know, some form of active, some people their active is the coaching side. Yeah. And yeah, it's a it's a mix of of all of the above. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Right. So um, so, so yeah, 2021, I was, I, I just kind of got into the mortgage business and it was, it was full fledged, like no time to kind of stop. And so the acquisitions kind of paused. We, we bird the seven and the eight plex, uh, over the course of a year There's in New Brunswick. Stop here. Check if this device is on your <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I should have put this on airplane mode. Um, no, no problem. You just repeat yourself. But Epic, just cut that part out. Uh, yeah. Just say what you're saying again. Uh, yeah. So, so 2021, ultimately, like it went into like the mortgage business just being like super crazy. Didn't really have time for acquisitions. We bird the seven and the eight plex over the course of a year. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it was really smooth in New Brunswick, which I loved. Um, and then I did end up buying a property out here in, in Kirkland Lake, a nine plex. Um, that was just a really good price relative to, to what I was doing. It was like 300K. Like, so nine plex for 300K. Oh, wow. But, but that's in Kirkland Lake, right? So. Yeah, which Obviously, what about a, what an hour from Timmins? Yeah, or maybe yeah, a bit six more. Six hours north from here. Um, yeah, so is Timmins, but Timmins you kind of going like this and Kirkland. Yeah, like I was just looking way. at that on the map because I was talking Timmins the last episode. Yeah, <laughs> but look, like a lot of like a lot of risk, right? It's a gold mining town, right? So mm -hmm. you get what you pay for. But for me, it was like nine plex, three hundred k. Yeah. So funny. The last guy on here was an actuary and wasn't talking oh, this yeah, kind of risk. A deal? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know a deal. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, so so that was the last acquisition I did in 2021. And then I took a basically a year off and I was just focusing on the mortgage business. Mm -hmm. I was going to go into the US. 
Um, I signed up with like Thomas and stuff like that to kind of like learn a little bit about the U.S. markets. And then 2022 happens here and all the rates start going up and uh, you start to see some decent opportunities pop yeah. up or at least less less competition, which is what yeah. I needed, right? I was like, I'm not trying to get blind into like multifamily deals and like you got to go firm at that time to like even get the deal without really knowing mm-hmm. half, the, half the time you buy in like a 10 unit building and you don't know like anything about the numbers. Like that's kind of the scenario that we were dealing with in 2021 when like the market was just getting crazy. Yep. Uh, so then, as soon it was as the market frenzy, turned, man, that yeah, was a was, frenzy was back crazy. then. It was it was silly, like uh, just people getting FOMO, and just wanting to invest so they could say they invested and paying ridiculous numbers that didn't make sense. And yep, um, yeah. but I think that's like that's a constant thing in our circles with some, not all. Like just there's those one that they just want to get going and they they make a rash decision. Yeah. So, I mean, kind of like dodged a bullet in my opinion, like for yeah. myself, like luckily I was busy on the mortgage world. So, so that you, it were, wasn't you weren't buying all those. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't intentional. No, that sounds like, like you're very bullet. like diligent. You yeah. you kind of come up with your own comfort level. I like that. You say, hey, for me, 15 units per city is, yeah. is comfortable. Per market, right. Yeah. Um, and then the market turned here. And so I stopped flipping. I was, I, was also, I was also flipping. I got that along the way, but it wasn't like crazy. It was one flip at a time, all cash, no Whereabouts? private money. Uh, basically, we had a crew from Belleville that would drive around to various areas. And so like I did a flip in Belleville first and then I did one in Tiny and then we did one in Chesley and then we did one in Prince Edward County. And then the Prince Edward County one is when the market turned and I just, I lost like 40, uh, 50 grand or something like that between me and my partner. But we had made money like on a couple of yeah. before that. So I was like, okay, it's okay. Yeah. But just didn't like the risk appetite come 2022 for flipping. So we stopped flipping as well. Um, and then 2022, we bought a uh, triplex in Sudbury and we bought a cottage uh, in Minden. Um, and so those two, we bird in April, pulled out that capital, and then I bought a seven unit building in Sudbury, but it's question still up as to what's the legal use, whether it's a fourplex or a fiveplex or a sixplex. Uh, the city has it as a, uh, I believe a fiveplex, MPAC has it as a sixplex, the legal zoning is for a fourplex. So we're going through the zoning zoning process to kind of- So like that. grandfather it in? Uh, no, it, it's, it's not. It's probably some element of like illegal units, but we're going through yeah. the zoning variants and stuff like that. And what I find is like, from talking to to the consultants that we're using, mm-hmm. um, a lot of times, like if you already have the units in place, like does the city really want to remove rental housing? And it's not like a dinky mm-hmm. like basement. This is like a proper like it looks purpose built, right? Yeah, and it's a big building. So that it can, looks like a purpose built yeah, complex. Yeah, but it's just somewhere along the way it was. Pro- it's not grandfather because like the units aren't that old. Like it's been like touched up, but. You yeah, just don't really have any documentation. So, yeah, I'll be interested to hear that how that turns out. That's a good point. If it's already there, but then are they setting a precedent for people to go out and create illegal units? But uh, you know, at what point is necessity going to be uh, you know thought about? Yeah, yeah, because they need housing there probably like they need it everywhere, right? True. Yeah, I, I bought it for five twenty. So like for me, it was seven units. Even if we call it a legal fiveplex or a legal fourplex, are you comfortable in those type of markets paying a hundred grand a door? Uh, so if we if we're if we're calling a fourplex and we're paying 125 a door, um, mm. and then if it was if if it comes down to hey this has to be a fourplex, I'm gonna make them into three bed units. I'm gonna like demo, demo the walls, right? I'm gonna make each unit bigger. Right now, a lot of it is one bed. Um, 100k a door is and like you're still in excess in the one percent rule, which is still like what I said. At 100k a door, yeah, you're gonna make you're gonna make a thousand on those. Yeah. yeah, especially once I make them into like three bed units, right? Then you're like closer to like that fifteen to sixteen hundred dollars a unit. Yeah. Um, as it is right now, they're one bed units, right? But mm-hmm. it's it's seven units. So, so if you want to make them into units. threes, how how much money are you going to spend to do that? A, a, a lot. Right? Yeah. Um, but but uh, you know it, that's not honestly that's not even the avenue that we're exploring right now because it's like we should be able to get the zoning amendment um, and the minor variances or go through the entire like we'll see. How, I, I just don't want to talk too much about like what we're going to have to do to kind of get up there, right? Yeah. But I think we should be able to kind of get it into that legal seven plex status, right? Um, yeah but that'd we'll be see. all right yeah did you know this going in or were you surprised yeah, yeah. no we knew the, the price that we were buying it at people were buying four and five unit like buildings for that price right so so you that's thought you're just it. i guess i'm just wondering at what point to you know do people pivot i know like everybody's comfortable in their markets yep. like nobody wants to leave ontario when you're set up in ontario true you yep. don't want to go to new brunswick if you don't have to um you know, at what point do people start looking elsewhere? I know many have, you know, they've, they've looked in other provinces or they look further north. I, that also is looking elsewhere, right? 
I don't think, you know, there are, I shouldn't say there aren't too many people with active strategies down there, down here. There probably are like flipping for sure, mm -hmm. yep. but acquisitions, I'm sure, you know, you can still make the deal, you know, you can, but it's harder, right? Like you're, you're going to be looking again, needle in a haystack comparatively. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of people feel the need to buy. Um, yeah. So I guess part of the journey here is I've repositioned a lot of my portfolio. So starting 2020, like June, we started selling off a bunch of single families, duplexes. We didn't sell any triplexes, but we had a lot of like, we had a couple of single families. So I sold um, last year, we probably sold like five or six properties. This year we've sold like five or six of them. Yeah. Right. So it's just been a lot of like, I just look at it as I'm selling this off and I'm just going to take that cash. And I'm going to invest in something else. Like I don't need to burn. Right, mm -hmm. which I think is a way to like multifamily because a lot of people are buying like seven, eight, ten unit buildings and they're going, I need to like refinance this, I need to like pull out my capital. What kind of cap rate are you buying at? Like, you don't need to burr, but yeah, yeah. So, like, the seven unit building is a, a little bit of an exception, right? But like, I'm just looking at it as 520 with the purchase price, seven units, the cash flow is heavy. I'm probably going to mm -hmm. spend about like 40 to 50k by the time I'm done with like on top of everything, right? So, I'm all in it for about 580. Um, with it as is rents, it came with two units vacant. But if you put market rents on that, I believe I was ending up at like an eight or nine cap, um, if my memory serves. Obviously, way too many. Eight or nine cap. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's but that's, that's if it's that's, a that's seven. With the, that's with the illegal units, right? Yeah, yeah. So once you're done legalizing it, you're spending the extra like forty to fifty grand to kind of go through that, and obviously you don't know what the city's going to say once they come in and dig around and poke holes and right. So you got to be comfortable with the unknown, right? But I think um, if mm -hmm. I can buy a property that cash flows in today's market, forget like really burning it. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm getting rid of. The reason we sold single families and duplexes is the economic risk, right? So like if you're in markets where layoffs start to happen and you've got single family houses and your tenant profile is for the most part going to be like heavily exposed to it, mm -hmm. right? What does that mean for a portfolio of like a bunch of like properties, right? Um, versus like if I can sell those off, put it, put that money into a seven unit building where like honestly, even if two, two units stop paying me rent, I'll be okay. It's just risk control, mm -hmm. right? So I think for the next like one to two years, it's going to be more so about um, like how do we weather the storm, right? And so a lot of that money has also gone into private lending, right? Consistent like passive income because you also realize a lot of this real estate, it's not cash flowing as well as we think. No. I mean, well, if you look <laughs> at the overall return, I mean, if you're not expecting values to go up and there's no cash flow and the interest yeah. rates are sky high, the actual ROI is like less than 10%. So if yeah. you can private land at 10, 12, 14, 15. Yeah. So, so yeah. That, that was my argument with flipping, right? Cause we were flipping and we were making money partially because the market was going up partially because we had no private money costs. Right. So then I just went, mm -hmm. okay, let's just say we do a, we buy for like 250, we sold for 400, let's just say on one of them. Um, but we spent like 80 grand in between there. So you're making, you're walking out with like 40, 50 K in profit. Mm -hmm. um, that 40, 50 K in profit over the course of like six months on a 250 K loan. It's a healthy rate of return. I think it works out to be like 25% or something like that. Right. Yeah. Um, but that's with all the risk. That's yeah. with the headache of going and checking up on these properties yeah, yeah. every other week. Um, headache of dealing with contractors. Everyone wants cash payments. If I give you cash then how do I get the deduction? Right. Yeah. All those kind of issues. And I just went, if I could just turn around and private lend this out at like 12% and like have yeah. a worry-free kind of like life and and no headache and no risk yeah. behind it which is like well there's risk but like there's less, risk. a different yeah. type of risk right mm -hmm. that to me was a lot more attractive so we just paused the flipping right so nice. i think it, it's just always like evaluating where are we yeah. in the market cycle yeah and, and just kind of pivoting your strategy based on that right i think yeah. some people don't pivot and that's where yeah that's where you had the most like pause risk. and reflect hi friends i just wanted to take a moment away from the episode to tell you about my brand new structured coaching program this is the first time i've ever offered a structured coaching program where we'll have regular meetings in addition to an intro call uh, to go through what your goals are and help you get on a plan to achieve those goals within real estate so if you have followed me for some time and you feel that i would be a fit for you to help you achieve your goals in real estate based on my skill set based on the topics we cover on this show I encourage you to head over to my website, andrew-hines.com forward slash coaching and fill out the questionnaire so that we can schedule a call and figure out if it's a fit for us to work together. Let's face it, most people could benefit from a second set of eyes and ears going over their strategies, different deals that they're looking at, and helping to springboard ideas back and forth. This is a program that's exactly for that. So if you're looking to build confidence in what you're doing in real estate investing and get very clear on what it is you're trying to accomplish, 
this might just be the program for you. Take a moment, fill out that questionnaire and let's schedule a chat. Yeah, I like that what you said there about the pause and reflect. Yeah. That's something I've been doing a lot of lately. Um, and I'm probably on the, um, <laughs> the side of maybe positing and reflecting a little too much sometimes. But, um, you know, so I'll pull the trigger on something and I'll, I'll go all in on that. And then after a while, if, I, if it doesn't seem to me like it's as good as it used to be, I'll, I'll stop it. I did that with the student rental, burrs and flips. Mm. Um, you know, now I'm looking at that with the Cape Coral stuff, um, with the adjustment of prices down over the last year and a half, um, and the increase in, in building expense, right. it's now not nearly as lucrative. So <laughs> and it's like, okay, so what am I going to do now? Am I going to go and, and build a house when I'm like, I'm running rough numbers and seeing like 20 K in profit. I'm like, well, that could easily swing. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's not like a worst case 20k like what if values come down what if you know costs go up like what if i have on you know this happened on one of my flips i had uh forty thousand dollars in extra sand fill needed to bring the grade up and there was my profit gone that's oop, crazy oop, here no more profit yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so if, if that can happen you know you got to reflect and say does it make sense to take that risk would i be better lending out that money yeah. or finding something else and i'd rather pause and let my money earn nothing for a second while i figure out what i'm going to do what does he have to hear? Nothing. Like yeah. now GICs are offering 5%. I think this EQ was offering 5% on a savings mm -hmm. account. And if you can stick that money in like a TFSA and like into from sure. through a TFSA into a GIC, if you're in 5% tax free, yeah. it's the same thing as earning hey, 10%. It's something. Right? It's something. Yeah. Same yeah. thing as earning 10% and paying your taxes on it, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot point. of like other opportunities that you got to consider in today's market that I think makes real estate a lot harder, right? But um it's just about constantly pivoting. And I I, I do think, uh, uh, you know, all this aside, I think one of the things that we're seeing more in like the mortgage world is people are buying active businesses, right? So forget like re real estate aside, right? I think there's going to be, mm -hmm. I think two things are going to start happening. I think one, people are going to be investing in small businesses, right? So whether it's purchasing um, completely like outside of like, like Kumons and like tutoring businesses and elementary school really? and daycares. Yeah, I'm having more and more and like, one of my clients wants to buy like a golf related like I don't I don't play golf so I don't know this stuff but you don't play golf the indoor <laughs> the indoor golf like stuff indoor I, I, golf simulator yeah yeah one of my clients is talking about yeah. that right so another one was talking about buying a Q one and another was talking about buying like franchises and stuff like that right um, and we're doing like more of those small business loans as well the government ultimately for better or for worse like the biggest issue that's yeah. happened is you take on debt but you don't put it towards improving your efficiency of of the country as a whole. Yeah. Right, so it went to, it directly into like people's pockets and whatever. That's a whole debate on its own. But finally, yeah. they're starting to. You know, I've not minced my words with these things. <laughs> my audience has heard it. Enough. Yeah, yeah. So we're not yeah. going to get into that debate. <laughs> but I think there's finally like government programs of okay, like take go and do like an audit of like your business and where can we implement t technology and the, the government will give you like a hundred grand if you can like get an audit done and a report that says you know we can implement technology and do certain things with it, right? Um, or can we go and buy capital like? So you they'll give the me a hundred grand. I don't know if I want to see. I, I I look at that as dirty money if I take the government's money. I really do. But uh, well, but but like it's finally going towards like the right things. Like how do we improve the efficiencies of business, which will then allow that business to make more money and therefore actually be able to afford more wages to like pay out to like your end, yeah your, your labor force, right? Because you, you you can't afford to pay people more because you get squeezed on all. Ends, well, right? yeah, I mean, like I, we pay. Like I just did. I just did payroll today. Yeah. Thirteen thousand for two weeks on my camp for that's just just the camp yeah yeah like it's insane in the summer and, and sometimes it's it's not, like sometimes it's still not like because we, we i was talking to someone that wanted a job for like 35k a year they were just like hey we just want to get in yeah me on my end i'm like yo like 35k that's that's basically that's good like i can afford that right but on the other end i'm looking at it and going how are you going to possibly live life? Like, what am I missing here? Well, there's they, people who can do that. I think they have an angle. Yeah. There's there's some sort of angle, yeah. unique <laughs> circumstance, because you're not going and renting a place on, on a $35,000 yeah, year. Like you're, yeah, he's a young guy living at home, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, if like you're that, living but... with your parents, you have the unlimited ability to go work jobs where you get to learn, prioritize yeah. learning. Yeah, that's I mean, that's, that's a great deal for them. But uh, yeah, I, I know I, I give my head a scratch with that stuff too sometimes. I'm like, how are you doing that? Yeah. How are you yeah. making that work? But the only way we can realistically like afford to pay more is if we start getting more efficient, right? So more efficient or more revenue. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Price increases and inflation goes up, and you know yeah. your average daily rate goes up. Yeah, then I can afford to pay more. But that means ultimately someone else is paying a higher per yeah. day, day as well, right? So um, if there's a way to like do it with less labor, but now pay each labor worker like more, right? That's mm -hmm. a way for wages to go up, and, and you kind of implement technology. Yeah. 
So like there's a, the Canadian small business loans and stuff like that that are happening where like, yeah, you could get 100K for technology like we talked about. There's also like, if yeah. you can buy like capital assets to kind of improve your like businesses operations and stuff like that, right? Whether it's like machinery yeah. or whatever. So you're starting to see like a lot of people buying these businesses and then considering these type of loans and like how can they mm-hmm. kind of come in and so you help them apply for those loans yes yeah, small business loans is something that we're like active like moving into like not that i'm like an expert in anything like that but um mm-hmm. it's kind of an area that i see kind of growing um and then the second side is construction right like that's more real estate related but multifamily apartment buildings i i have like an unpopular opinion on this which is i don't think it makes sense in today's world i think you're taking on um, significant risk in Ontario specifically, right? Mm. Um, because we, there, you've got to assume at least like five years for maybe mm. like 20 to 30% of your tenant profile to naturally like turn over, right? I think a year ago, cash for keys, it was working, right? Um, today, like a year ago or a year and a half ago, it was real estate's going up, blah, blah, blah. That was what the news and the media was all, everyone was talking about. And then it was real estate is crashing. Now, if you go and you look at like the news and the media, it's rent prices are are three thousand dollars for like a one bedroom or whatever and like that's like all over the news so like now the tenant profile is much more knowledgeable as well about like hey like if i leave this unit i'm gonna pay x x dollars more which then makes cash for keys a lot a lot more difficult yeah um you're still gonna find those short-sighted people but also they're getting coached a lot Uh, i was talking to kellen about it he he was saying it's a standard ten thousand. i'm like dude like yeah why are tenants so aware of this like i i'd get people out for like i'd pay like 500 bucks towards their moving that was a truck good before uh, I'd, I'd rent <laughs> them a bin yeah. i'd rent them a bin to throw their stuff out like that was yeah, what yeah. i was doing to get people out <laughs> <laughs> and that was good, you know good times before right yeah. and, and if you had a unit that you know was falling apart and you you genuinely want to go and renovate it like the tenant was more than happy to yeah. take a thousand bucks two thousand bucks and kind of leave yeah. right but today they're like you know what we'll just live in our in our in our yeah, we'll conditions, stay. you know. Yeah, um, but so so I look at Ontario as yeah. I mean, we're not alone in that and seeing that as a risk. I think here's the here's the wild card. Um, obviously, obviously, there's a lot of crony capitalism happening in Ontario. Doug Ford, you know, let's let's face it, he's he's got his palms greased by a few people. There's going to come a point where institutional buyers want to come in and they want to be able to efficiently run these and they're going to i think that this will sway back the other way in ontario to be more landlord friendly but won't help the masses like not at all it'll be a landlord state uh and and, you know so you'll have you'll have your your owner class which will be you know five percent of the population and then the 90 percent 95 percent will be renters and this is my forecast for like the next 10 to 20 years uh, in Ontario. But I do think, and I heard a rumbling from somebody who I respect his opinion a lot, uh, and, you know, it could be hearsay, it could be whatever, but uh, he did say he had, you know, he had heard some inklings that this may be coming uh, and that there may be a, a shift back away from these rent controls. Yeah, but then what what ultimately happens is then your your 95% of the population gets increasingly unsat- unsatisfied and if they have no prospect of owning housing. They already don't. Um, yeah, the more realistic that becomes, the more unrest kind of pops up right yeah do you and that's a great conversation like at what point (laughs) like because because you kind of doom uh a state to socialism when you take away their ability to own private property yeah uh you're doomed to it because when people own nothing and still have the right to vote they vote for whoever will give them the most handout yeah i own nothing who's going to give me the most stuff and that's what's happened in the last couple years and you, you can imagine how that will metastasize like a tumor in in a place like Ontario. Until you then have to go nuclear the other way, which yeah. then also causes a little bit more unrest. Well, but right? yeah, so I, I think about this a fair bit, like the conditions and circumstances that led up in Russia before it became Soviet Union. Was yeah. it similar? Like infighting, groups couldn't agree, which I, I think there was I a lot of that. I wish I knew. <laughs> yeah, I wish I knew. Like history books, I mean, obviously they've been scrubbed over yeah, the last yeah. hundred and some odd years. Uh, but, uh, you know, like... It, whatever direction we're heading in, it can't yeah. be good. You, you just look at this, the elements that are are involved, right? Like so, so, personal accountability exists in a capitalist society. It doesn't in a socialist society. Yeah. So so the, the government's perspective, I think, on how do we get out of this current predicament that we're in with a debt, because that's another issue, is immigration, right? So they're not, mm. they're probably not going to lay off on that, which is then causing a shortage of housing, which is then pushing a landlord state, right? So what is the solution in between? Because mm-hmm. ultimately, like, we're in real estate and we got to figure out where is the opportunity lying today, right? I see it in new construction. 
You do? Yeah. Okay, interesting. Right? In, in, in rental grade new construction, not like these condos. And Ch- tell me, like tell me your vision. I want to hear it. <laughs> no, I, I, I think it, you know. It, just to pause on that though, like I love the attitude. Like I don't look. At, I'm not doom and gloom. Yeah, like yeah. I think, man, future's never we're, been brighter. <laughs> we're, we're, we're opportunistic, right? Like you just got to see the opportunity wherever it is. Right? Yeah, and, and you know, yeah. 2020, you see the opportunity, and everyone's too scared, so you go and buy real estate. Uh, 20, the end of 2020, 20, going into 2021, it was honestly for me, it was New Brunswick. And then it was just the active business with the run up in the real estate cycle. That's really where I yeah. saw the most opportunity. 2022 was great because it's peak fear again. So you buy a little bit risk controlled because it's mm-hmm. a highly risky market, right? This year, I'm kind of looking at things. I'm going, I wouldn't say it's peak fear because there's people that are buying, right? So it's not like I'm able to like throw like low ball offers and stuff like that. Yeah. So, I'm, you know, I, I catch myself kind of looking into the market and seeing where is your opportunity. Obviously, like the boomer generation retiring means significant opportunity in business acquisitions. But do I really like the mortgage business is very active for me. So do I really have time yeah. to go and dedicate into like buying a, another business, which will still require you to spend time like yeah. boots in the ground? Not really, right? So I'm kind of just focus on, okay, I'll help people like buy those businesses, arrange funding, stuff like that. So that's cool. Um, but with real estate investing, where do I want to go from here? It's ultimately, I think, into the construction game because you're post-2017, so no rent control until they, obviously there's a risk at any point that they could change that, right? Well, they did in, uh, what, when? 2015? What, what what year was it? Because it used to be 93. Anything built that. after 93 was <laughs> not, was not rent okay. controlled. And then Kathleen Wynne changed, changed that in her government. Uh, and then it was Doug, Dougie Doug. Boy in 2017 said, okay, anything built as of now will be not rent controlled. So, that's so they've we- already pulled the, the rug out once. Yeah. And you're always one bonehead political decision away, uh, yeah. if you subscribe to to that whole notion. Yeah. Uh, away from that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. But look, like you can build construction costs is something that we got to figure out and, and bringing development fees down. I think the government, hopefully, in the next couple of years will get smarter and, and find ways oh, to kind I of would make never it bank more incentivizing. On that. CMHC and like the financing <laughs> options that are there helps, right? Um, but I think, you know, we, we got to start developing more, whether it's modular homes, whether it's garden suites and laneway housing and all there'll, that There'll be stuff, an angle, but. like, and it's the crony capitalism that kind of gives me a little bit of, uh, I'm not going to call it hope, but I mean, whatever, like you look at it, let's make lemonade. Um, you're going to have your institutions that are going to come in. They're going to start buying up residential real estate. That's already happening. It's yep. happening in the States. It's been publicized. It's going to happen more here, especially with four units per house. Yeah. And well, that's Toronto, yeah. right? You're three units per house. Everywhere Actually, no, else. you're three You're three units per house in London right now. Can you also do a laneway on top of that? I think you can. London's allowing three units in like in one the, in the house. Yeah, although well, they didn't want to. So yeah. one of the houses I sold, the guy who bought it, was doing that. He was It was already a duplex yeah, yeah. and he was adding a third unit. They got their, their permit app in and then I'm on the email thread and I'm seeing, oh, well, we're not allowing that. This was after Bill 23. Yeah. And uh, then the guy's like, well, Bill 23 says you have to. <laughs> and, you know, they argue a little yeah. bit, but I'm assuming it, it actually, I, I know they got their permit approved because I get the inspection notices. So wow. they yeah. resisted it. So this is the thing. Like the mis- municipalities were saying no, yeah. even though the province kind of dictated it. So, so that's honestly, that's, that's a, a perfect example, right? Like the densification is one arm of things. I think like the single family to triplex conversions or single family to four unit conversions that are happening in Toronto, I like. I like that strategy because you buy the single family house and for the most part, you can buy a single family house that comes vacant. Yeah. Right. The problem is you try and buy a 10 unit apartment building. It's coming with all these tenants with way under market rents. Forget that. What's the solution? Build this thing ground up. You can you yeah, really you, charge top market rents. Yeah. You, know, you don't have to worry it's about it. It's just, vacancy. are you going to build it? Like, let's say you're doing really well and you're building, you know, a 10 unit building for 180 a square foot yeah. plus your servicing, your parking lot, you know, you're in for 200 after that. And that yeah. this is if you're doing exceptionally well at it. Um, can you fetch the money you need back to make that make sense? It depends on the market. Yeah. Right. So it's it's not gonna work in every market. Like obviously construction has to make sense. It's not gonna work in Sudbury. Yeah. Windsor for the most part, like I've I've heard some recent numbers from I don't know if you know Clark, but uh we got him on the podcast. We were talking about a couple like of his development stuff that he's got going on and he's constructing like modular homes for about like 150, 160 K, which isn't bad. That's yeah, yeah. So he just brings them to site and sets them down. So yeah. this is the all in cost including foundation put there. Yep. So they they truck in the house yeah. and that's that's their cost to the uh to the that, client. To, to, to the client. That's what he was telling yeah. us because we we also have some plots there that we were like debating what what do we do in the future. 160 a square foot. Okay. No, no, 160k for like a tiny home. 160k. Okay. Right? So do you like what uh, square footage would they be? 
uh, I feel like you said it was like 500. Like on a per square footage, it's off because it's a single. It doesn't look great. Yeah. It's a single. It's a single home, right? But once you get into like a triplex, yeah. uh, it was coming down. I can't remember the numbers off my head. I mean, I I say this like if I GC myself, I could I could get things cheap. It's just that's such a pain in the ass. But look yeah. at it this way: like 150k for a single family home that you could potentially rent out for about 1600. One percent rule is kind of yeah, yeah. So I, and I like that you said that because I was thinking like ADUs. Can you do them for two hundred grand? I feel like um, I feel like you can. They're going to be small per square foot. It's going to be expensive. Yeah. Uh, the biggest thing is the existing house and where you're connecting services. Yeah. How are you getting water to it? How are you getting sewage to it? And then uh, the fees, like the development fees. Well, Try development fees should be a non-issue right. Yeah. now, right? Like yeah. uh, according to the province. So right. there should be no, I'm just saying 200 grand just to build it. Yeah. Uh, that would be do if you're doing well. If you're hiring the wrong contractor, you're going to pay potentially 400 grand. Yep. So if it's 200 grand and you're $2,000 a month rent on it, yep. well, that is 1% rule. Yeah. It's so just, and, and now we're starting to see yeah. on the financing side for a long time. For a long time, the biggest issue was one house, one yeah. lot. That's the value and we're just not going to factor yeah. it. In. Right. But now we're starting to see more solutions kind of come in on we'll value that addition, yeah. like garden suite house or the garage house or whatever you want to call it. Right. Oh, uh, they're going to value it now. Yeah. Yeah. As, yeah. as the policy changes, they'll start, uh, you know, if it's legal, they're going to start bringing yeah. it into their programs as it becomes more common. Yep. Yeah. So we, we've yeah. already seen the changes on, on some of the lenders. Right. So there's actual like financing solutions. So I think moving forward, we're going to start seeing more and more of these garden yeah. suites pop up. That's one side. Like, honestly, say there's like a thousand houses in like a little town and like, Five percent of the population decides to add garden houses, garden suites. It's not going to make a dent in like the, the the level of issues that we're dealing with in like rental housing, right? Mm -hmm. You need to have like the ten unit like apartment building starting to pop. Yeah, up, yeah, and it right? will happen. I think. Like, yeah. look at uh, look at the Soviet Union. Like, uh, like there are cities where all you can find you can't find single family homes. It's yeah. just apartment buildings. Yeah, it's true, right? Because so, that's that was efficient <laughs> housing. It wasn't efficient to build houses. Yeah, yeah, and like like I've, I've, we've got like a developer that that we know who's who's in Toronto and Scarborough, like just taking like single family houses and converting them into like four unit buildings as well. I'm yet to see the numbers on that because I feel like Yeah, I'd like to see new. see the numbers anytime I talk. Like I just I've been working on like a little purpose built reel running through that scenario in Hamilton. Like what mm -hmm. you're gonna pay. One of my uh some of my coaching students were gonna do that with their home and we ran through the numbers and and now they're thinking, okay, no, we're probably not gonna to yeah. complete it. Yeah. Um but uh well, let's I've been just thinking say, about it even on like a, a we have a bungalow in Scarborough. Um add a second floor to that one. That'll probably cost me about two hundred to two hundred fifty K just for that one unit. Uh, main floor could be another yeah. unit, basement another unit. So now you've got three units easily in like the main house. And yeah, you've got a garage suite going on in the back. But like, if you were to buy in today's prices, you're buying that bungalow for like 900k, and then you're spending 200k to add a floor, so you're at 1.1, and then you're building another 200k in the back. You're still in it for like 1.3, very very conservatively. Yeah. Right? Realistically, you're going to be in around 1.4, maybe 1.5 yeah. even. Right. Um, I have clients that are doing it in Toronto. The problem is, it's a high income earner game. Right? Yeah. Like you're not doing this earning 80K a year. Like yeah, it's just yeah. not the reality. You're for the most part, like my mortgage clients are doing it. Two couples earning like 100, 150 each combined mm -hmm. income, 250 to 300K. They want to live in Toronto yeah. or they want to have like one or two properties that each one is a fourplex. Each one is worth $2 million. Makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. Right. Why have like 10 different properties in Windsor if you're like a high income earning individual? Yeah. Right. So, it's all like perspective and like who are you as an individual what are your finances like and that kind of ultimately determines what's the yeah. strategy that makes sense right so let's just look at like that in, in isolation here so if i was just running the numbers while you're speaking um and i was paying attention I'm multitasking. <laughs> yeah. um, so so two thousand dollars a month uh yeah. if you could get that for rent say hypothetically you could build it for 200 grand i think that that's like it's a pretty rare find if you're going to build it for 200 grand but let's just say yeah. hypothetically it's possible yeah um 1500 added taxes so i'm only doing incremental change let's just say it adds okay. 1500 to your annual taxes 1500 to your annual insurance uh okay. maintenance i'm going to keep at five percent so 1200 a year uh utilities i'm going to assume that you can you can Pass do a recovery to the tenant but yeah. let's call it like 500 bucks a year uh in case there's anything okay. off uh management i'm just going to throw one percent in there um just in case uh, for self-management yep. and uh, landscaping and snow, assuming you were already paying that, you know, add right. 200 bucks for an extra parking space and um, miscellaneous. I like to keep in at 500 bucks. So if that's 200 bucks, your cap rate on that is about 9%, yep. which I actually remember running this with uh, somebody else who had been on the show uh, and that actually on its own, if you already own the property, there's a case for investing money in that. Yep. Um, 
is it right? No, I'm not going to answer that, but uh, it's, you know, depends on you and what your goals are and what you're working on. But say you're six, six percent on a 30 year AM for the added mortgage, you go 80 percent, you know, on 200 K mortgage that you're adding on 200 K. Like we're just doing incremental. You're adding that you're doing a blend and increase currently rates around six percent. That decision appears to cash flow just short of no more. How much you writing? 578. The mortgage on 200K, maybe about 1200? Uh, no, no, mortgage is 80% of 200K. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. So assuming, yeah. Oh, you're not getting the per- perfect burr. Yeah, yeah. So you're, you're 40 grand into it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, that makes sense, right? And and the the tricky part was, because like all this stuff has existed, people have done the ADUs for a while, but the financing was nearly impossible unless you go commercial. Mm-hmm. And then the problem with commercial is the cities in which this works, where like the value is justifiable and like the construction costs were justifiable as like Kitchener, Toronto, markets where commercial financing just isn't a viable option for a four unit property mm. right but now you're starting to see b lenders like equitable like a couple like other other people offer residential financing to kind of pull out your capital and it's a matter of time until all the banks start to accept this and and kind of allow the two properties on two buildings on one lot kind of approach. so you're saying like scotia bank right now wouldn't accept it no we just we just did an appraisal yeah. the, the client told me it was a triplex and it was really a duplex plus a garden suite mm-hmm. they said it was a triplex go through everything they get won't the value appraisal, it. they value it as a duplex yeah. So now we're switching it on to the B side just to pull out the yeah because the value of the garage the garden suite is a lot right uh, oh it's that huge easily bump the value by about well but it, 200. you might as well play in the commercial game when you're when you're getting to that so if I adjust these numbers for commercial I'm going to go 75 percent loan to value and then your amortization is probably going to be more like 25 25. and yeah. your interest rate is going to be a little bit higher yeah. maybe 6.5 7 7 7.5 7, 5. seven. <laughs> all right so yeah. we'll call it seven you're yeah. still cash flowing 479 on that yeah. at seven percent. The name of the game yeah. right now is it's not even like really cash flow. It's yeah, you got to cash flow for the sake of like yeah. earning some sort of cash on cash and, and you don't want to be breaking even or negative, right? But it's really like buy and hold for un, until like the rates eventually mm-hmm. stabilize. I don't I don't think we're at a point right now where rates will stay this high forever. I don't think we're coming down like people, some people yeah. think we're coming down. I think we come down like one, one and a half percent kind of like end up in that five to four and a half kind of rate, yeah. rate range, right? Um, at which point the cash is going to be significantly higher, right? Yep. So that's, so, you know, rewind it all back. I think, you know, if I talk about like, where do we see, uh, where do we see options or, or what kind of things are people doing to kind of invest in today's market? I think it comes down to, you're either going the business side and active business investing, or you're going down this construction side and there's this the avenue value the- add side, right? Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. yeah. actually, um, on that note, I did have, I was just talking to Jake about this on REI hot seat. We, he found this property in a smaller town. Um, I'm not supposed to say exactly where, but, <laughs> um, this like beautiful stone face, like old building, like kind of like this type of stuff you'd see in Guelph, like those stone buildings, um, massive parcel, had a barn on it, has an eight car garage with eight separate doors that can all be rented out. The barn can be rented out. Mm-hmm. Uh, the existing building, six units, but could be converted into eight. Yeah. Uh, and then there's huge development potential. And, and we were just going through all the possible ways you could turn it into a money maker. Yeah. And I feel like those type of deals still exist, but those are where you're making the deal. Yeah. Like you, you got work to do. Like, to your point, you got to have some deep pockets behind yeah, you yeah. <laughs> because it's not for somebody with just a few bucks yeah. because there's, you know, you're going to have some carrying. Uh, but we actually worked at a scenario where it could cash flow from day one. So he's already like kind of loosely pre negotiated with the seller yeah. for a VTB. Okay. Yeah. So it could cash flow from day one. You can convert the the units. Uh, so it used to be like the upper floor and the main floor used to be two separate units each, and they were yeah. merged into one. But right. they can be reseparated into two, at least physically. I don't know about legally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you have to go through that process. But uh, so we were just kind of running through the scenarios, and there was a way to have it cash flow day one, and also turn it into something that would be like an, a based on what was into it, like a nine cap. Um, those type of deals, like they still exist. And for yeah. creative problem solving people, yeah. you can just, you figure it out. Like you just, you know, in a way, good deals will come to you, but that's because you kind of have the eyes to see. Yep. Yeah. And, and like, like the really good deals are still flying. There was a, I think it was a 20, I can't remember if it was 21 or 27 unit building that popped up, not this last weekend, the weekend before that. And it popped up on the Friday. I saw it on the Saturday. I'm like, yeah, it's a Saturday. Like, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll I think it was, was it a long weekend? No, it wasn't. But I was doing stuff on the weekend. I was like, I'll, I'll revisit this on Monday. We got about on Monday, called the realtor on Tuesday. I'm like, hey, like, you know, I'm interested in this building. Can you send me over the numbers? I'm thinking I'm probably like one of the few guys that are like on top of this thing because no one's really buying commercial that much today. He's like, yeah, there's already an accepted offer. I'm like, what? <laughs> and then he's like, yeah, but it's conditional. I'm like, okay, cool. So maybe I go in for the backup. He's like, but we did get a backup offer. 
And I was just like, forget it. What was the type of building? It was a, I think it was a 27 unit residential building. It was listed for 1.8. So really good price in Sudbury. Oh, right? okay. But it was obviously all like way under market rents, but it's the type of property that you just Yeah, but buy. you're buying well under a hundred K a door. Yeah, like that's, that makes sense. And I was still looking at it as I'd probably have to put about six to 800 K in. Cause I know the entire CMHC play, but like honestly, 50 year amortizations don't really speak to me. Right. So I was just thinking, okay, I just buy it normal resident, uh, commercial financing, 25 year am, but like get two friends, put in 250 K each heavy down payment, small loan, yeah. it's a 27 unit building, natural attrition. Why don't you like, like why don't you like the CMHC play? 50 year amortization like you could go 40 you don't have to go yeah 50. you could go 40 yeah you could go 40 that's true you go 35 30 and then the fees and like how long am i going to wait well the I fees yeah time? that's the biggest reason not to what are the fees I, at now yeah like, like I, I look at my portfolio as by the time i'm 40 i'm not going to buy any more real estate i'm 31 now and i'll just keep like stacking it very comfortably mm -hmm. and then if i stop at the age of 40 i'm already not like like my kirkland like has like a 150k mortgage on it, and i debate all the time do i just pay it off Right, mm -hmm. just have my, my real estate like completely debt free, right? And so like for sure by the time I'm 40, I'm not gonna refinance anything. I'm gonna probably stop buying. And then by the time I'm 60, I ideally wanna have everything paid off. Right. Nice. That's like how I look at it. Yeah. Um, it's not about like having like 200 units yeah. to me. Right? It's about like have like a core, like 50 to 100K. I'm at, I'm at 50 units right now. And if I can just stay at 50, I'm perfectly fine. If I go to like 100, that's perfectly fine. It's really, to me, it's assets under management. And if I look at my asset profile, like if I have 10 million assets under management, um, which obviously has debt on, on it, right? So it's not like a $10 million net worth. But by the time I'm like 60, if I can remove that that debt, the debt yeah. then you're just 10 million net worth. Yeah, just, yeah you'd be laughing. That's enough, right? So um, so from that perspective, CMHC, it's not in line with my goal, right? Because it's- No, I, I, I get that. Option. I mean, it would be useful in the short run and you could just, you know, prepay yeah. it when the term uh, comes up for comes maturity, up for right? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. can do that. Yeah, yeah. to me, it's honestly, it's more of a game of I, I want to pay down my debt. I want to have a few assets that are highly cash flowing um, mm -hmm. rather than having multiple assets and multiple exposures. So I'm not refinancing as much and, you know, I'm not really doing that kind of game as much. I'm more so have a certain pool of because even the seven unit building, like I, could, I could refinance it to the max and like pull out more than what I put into it is, is my thought process. But I'd rather just pull out the I have about like 150, maybe by the time I'm done with it, I'll have like 170, 180 into it. I'd rather just pull that out and just take that money to the next one, leave a little bit of equity, yeah. right? Yeah, I don't blame you. Um, so it's, it's you know, especially with the own, rates everyone's now. Everyone's got a different strategy, I think. Right? Yeah, especially with the rates now. When the money was cheap, it, it made yeah. sense to have the extra money and put it to work somewhere because you, yeah. you could make that money make money. Now it's becoming pretty opportunistic to save the uh, the interest that you're paying yeah. on the mortgage or, or whatever, especially if you're paying privates or something. And I know for a long yeah. time, everyone was like, you know, don't pay off your primary residence. But yeah. even earlier this year, it was a question of, do we just take the money that we have and pay down our primary residence? That is year? actually a goal I have yeah. uh, to just have free and clear. Primary. Well, when it was 2%, it, it really didn't make much sense. But when it's now we're paying, because I'm on a variable, <laughs> uh, some with everyone else out there that's struggling at Scotia, but uh, we're at, I think, six point something now on the rate. It's like that's like not a bad rate to just pay like slowly pay down as much as possible. It's tax free, like savings, yeah. and where it's case you do the Smith maneuver later on, right? And there's kind of opportunities there. But yeah. the strategies that work 2020, 2021 is not like the environment that we're in today. Yeah. Right? And I think a lot of people just focus on just the interest rates, but like inflation is not going to get under control. We've got like global supply chain issues. So many like macro like level issues that we're dealing well, with. Well, plus the other yeah, constant spending, like they're not changing yeah. anything. Like they would not have even needed to raise interest rates if the government just had a balanced budget. Yep. And, and honestly, one guy yeah. asked me this on, cause I, I, I do the rants. I'm not like, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not as into the economics as you guys, but um, I, I do like post certain things about it. And someone's asking me like, you know, what, what would the solution have been? It's fine to do the one lockdown and take on the debt for the one lockdown while we didn't know, but the, it's a repetitive behavior that's now become yeah. normalized. And see, I actually didn't have... think it was it was even okay to do that. I mean, since when is it okay for government to tell people what to do? Government it, serves the people; yeah. it doesn't control them. <laughs> but like, like, there's got to be a hybrid. Never... There's got to be hybrid because yeah, like you know, like whatever. If you want to appease everyone, like I understand, like there is a hybrid yeah. approach. Well, what's wrong with saying like everyone? If that if you don't feel comfortable, work. yeah, that's stay home. Saying. That's what I said. If you do that. feel comfortable, <laughs> go. Yeah. Uh, what, what I had a problem with is the amount of people they broke. They destroyed them. How many people killed themselves? Because their business, mm -hmm. they were, these were people who, like a hairdresser who had a home. Mm -hmm. And because of the lockdowns, their business basically lost all revenue, had to sell his home just to not like go bankrupt right. and move in with his parents. 
at you know an age well beyond 40. You know, how many people that's a that's a positive story. What about the ones that never had debt and then when they their loans got recalled or the interest rate went up, they they had to take on debt because of all this. Yeah. And then killed themselves because they couldn't get it done anymore. Yeah. Like we're, that scenario, that story does exist out there. And and when, since when don't we allow people the freedom of self-determination? You yeah. know, like that that type of thing really uh that's why I was so outspoken back then because it just kind of pissed me off. But you know, it woke me up to a lot of stuff and I'm not an angry guy or you know, I'm not uh you know, I'm well past all that, uh, yeah. but uh, I am aware and I'll never forget. Yeah, and I, I think it's interesting, like now, like even a lot of the people that took on the SIBO loans, like we're dealing with the repayment stuff that's happening on that, right? Yeah. You have to repay it or you're potentially giving up as a solid 33% rate of return, right? But yeah, um, you know, there's really no such thing as free money, which I think- Right, which is why paying. I don't like taking the government's money yeah. because there's a, there's, there is no such thing as free money. There's, yeah. there's a very dirty string attached to that somewhere. Yeah. Hey, well, and look what that TIFF, yeah, the little troll Tiff Macklem did. Uh, sorry, I just made a joke. I'm like, does he look like a little weasel on my <laughs> Instagram? Uh, anyways, uh, he told us, oh, we're going to keep interest rates low for a very True. long time. You know, he encourages, it was a honeypot. Mm -hmm. You know, get people to take on all this cheap debt, drive up asset prices. And then it all comes crashing down when you raise the uh, the interest rates, the asset prices come down. They honeypotted the Canadians at, at, at a mass scale. And uh Again, doesn't sit well with me. At the end of the day, like I, I'm always about let's make lemonade. You know, if we got lemons, we make lemonade. But it, it grosses me out what yeah. they did. I do think you have to go against the grain a little bit, and you, a lot of it is like, yeah. you got to use your own brain a little bit too, right? Like sure. I think, um, two percent, three percent was. I got locked. I, I got stuck in this variable because yeah. I was trying to time this thing and I was trying to refinance my primary. We closed in March, 2022. So we closed it last yeah. year. I was like, okay, I'm just gonna say variable for three months. I'm gonna lock it in right after. And then of course they start to increase the rates and stuff like that starts to happen. But um, you know, mm -hmm. I don't think anyone saw where we're at now coming either. Like the rate at which we went up. Is, I didn't think so. I didn't yeah. think they had it in them, especially with this, we'll hold your hand, take care of you. But that's the that's the beauty of the honeypot. They treat mm -hmm. you like they want, they they actually care about you until they actually just drive you into the ground, yep. which uh, is, is what they've uh, obviously in practice done. Yep. Um, and I know like, you know, People are just doing what they can, right? No one, I, I think in general, people yeah. just keep trying to keep their mind positive. They're trying to look, hey, where are we going for the future? Yeah. They're not dwelling on it. Um, I, I think you should hold people accountable for what they do. But at the same time, yeah, good. it's a good to focus on our own situation. We as entrepreneurs, we're focused on how do you, um, how do you make these situations into the best they can possibly be? Yep. And uh, like, that's what I said, like, I'm pretty optimistic for the future. I, I think like it's ripe with opportunity. Uh, we just got to be able to be willing to look where for that those opportunity that have the is. Capital. For those that have the those capital. That have the capital and those yeah. that have the willingness to see where and what it is, right? Yeah. Like so many not so where willing. Do you, to, where do you see opportunity? Uh, I think there's opportunity in multiple different strategies. Like there's lots of different opportunity in different areas of the States. Like I just said, you know, Cape Coral isn't what it was to me earlier on, but there's still many other things that work. Like I just interviewed a guy doing land flipping and he's crushing 40% profit margins, mm -hmm. uh, figures he'll be between five and 10 million in sales this year. Uh, yeah. like any, you know, shares everything about it. Like that's that kind of thing to me is like, it pumps me up. Like there's yeah. lots of people making money out there, yeah. uh, but you do have to pivot as we've talked about. Yeah, and I, I think you got to constantly pivot. I think, yeah, a lot of people I know are still doing the same thing they were doing a year ago, two years ago. And that probably won't yeah. work. It, there's, very, I don't know anyone actually where it's actually working, right? Like if you pivoted, it could be pivoting markets. It could be pivoting strategies instead of burying your flipping. It could be instead of uh, uh, doing unsecured prom notes, you're now doing uh, secured private lending or you're doing uh, equity stakes in various development projects for mm -hmm. whatever, right? But there's got to be, for the most part, a pivot that's happening um, because the same strategies I worked before just are not working today, Yeah, right? Or it's like someone that used to invest in Toronto is now investing in Windsor, which works for them, right? Because they were used to the, they were used to the Toronto rates yeah, of return yeah. and now they're used to Windsor rates of return. But the guy that's investing in Windsor, if he keeps investing in Windsor, it does not work for him. The way it did, Because right? he's not getting the same thing that he got before. Well, you have those deep pocketed investors who like they'll invest in Toronto right now and they don't care because their time horizon is is way long. They don't care if it's negative right. cash flow. Like it doesn't matter. They'll they'll wait 20 years with the this stuff. And, and to be fully clear, like I'm personally, I've been looking in Toronto for like the last year. Mm -hmm. and I saw the price. This happened to me during COVID as well, which kind of drove me nuts. But prices came down to about... 7.30 on like these bungalows. And I was like, no, I want it at 700. And then prices rebound back up. And of course I lost my opportunity there. Yeah. Um, and same thing again last year. I was like, no, I'm, I'm yeah. 700 on a bungalow. Like tell me when I can get it. And I will I will pick up these bungalows because they are on 
40, 50 lot, like 40, 50 by a hundred um, oh, lots yeah? that are like perfect. So where in Toronto would this be? Uh, Scarborough. Like I know Scarborough. Scarborough. Okay. Yeah, I'm just familiar with it. We grew up uh, just on the Markham Scarborough, like borderline. So I'm very familiar with the market and it's ultimately what I'm comfortable with. But I think the right prof, um, portfolio, I think will have like highly cash flowing assets and, and appreciation. Side so of a mix place. of both. Yeah, yeah. And I, I've always thought that too, it's just the concentration needs to, like there needs to be a strong focus on cash flow first before yeah. you bring in the stuff that, that doesn't make cash. Yeah. So I, I yeah. started off with the Toronto yeah. stuff. I saw that the risk, which was it's a house of cards that mm -hmm. if one or two tens stop paying me rent high exposure. Then I went to Windsor, got, got a little bit of cash flow there. New Brunswick's running on its own now. And I've got the stuff up north that's heavily cash flowing. So I can use that cash yeah. flow to supplement another Kirk portfolio. Kirkland here. Lake must, must crush. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Nine units. And uh, what are the average yeah. rents there? Uh, I've got, I, I've, I've got two or three units at like 500, which I just left them alone. Like didn't, didn't bother with the cash for keys, just completely left them. Yeah. I have two, no, I have three units at about a thousand. Um, and then I have uh, two commercial because it's a nine plex, but it's two commercial, oh, okay. seven residential. Uh, the two commercials are are dirt low again, like nine hundred. But um, I'm I'm honestly perfectly fine with that because yeah. I've got such a small mortgage and it's very like yeah. no one gives me any trouble. Everyone kind of takes care of their stuff. Everyone's kind of grateful mm -hmm. and and happy, right? Yeah. Um, and and it still cash flows me. I want to say like a couple thousand. I want to say like two thousand or so. We just finished the last unit, um, which is why I'm like I'm not even sure what's cash flowing me anymore, but probably about like 2000 or so a month um, yeah. because the water bill, the, the gas bill is, is crazy. And that's what no one talks about. Like up oh, north, there's yeah. different issues. My snow, my snow contract for a season is about 2.5 K. Yeah. Right. Versus like I could do a house in like my primary residence. We could do for like 700 for a season. Yeah. Right. In GTA. Right. Cause you're getting different levels of snow. My water yeah. bill, um, not water bill, my heating bill last year was about 14,000, which is, on the nine, <laughs> crazy right yeah. um and, and so like when the bills came and i called them and i'm like look so like what's happening do i have like a leak like what's going on and they're like no your, your consumption is down like year over year over the two years that i had it I'm like well then why was the bill before that like last the year before that about like nine thousand, and now we're at like fourteen thousand, and they're like well, that's because gas rates have just been astronomical and yeah blah 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 and all this shit and now it's back down apparently so i'm hoping this winter yeah. is not as bad but <laughs> let's yeah, kind of wait and see what happens right so up there yeah. in the arctic yeah <laughs> <laughs> i wonder if like heat you go heat pumps i don't yeah. really trust them though they break i've been thinking yeah. about that i've been uh, yeah. there's gonna have to be we also have a boiler it's like a gas boiler system so uh, yeah. there's gonna be some efficiency plays that now that everything is stabilized on the rent side yeah i'll start yeah. dealing with like the actual buildings so it's gonna be a slow like interesting just to take the cash flow reinvest it yeah. into the building until like everything is done and then just rake it all in <laughs> cool man um any final thoughts to, uh, before we wrap up no i thought you know i think it's a great great podcast i really enjoy your show as well and um yeah it's always kind of fun to talk economics and cool man i think not enough people look at the economy as a whole I think that's probably the mistake we make um, yeah. is we're siloed into our real estate investing. We think interest rates is the only thing that matters, but there's a lot that goes behind the interest rates and, and kind of what kind of feeds into it. Yeah. If you're not a big picture thinker, um, obviously, you know, give it a try, yeah. uh, but also <laughs> speak with people who are, yeah. you know, and start, start seeing the different, you know, issues that, that they're seeing. Uh, I think, you know, to a fault, I'm a big picture thinker, like probably too much sometimes um if that's possible like to the point where it might disrupt my uh, my actual engagement and 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 you know pulling the trigger on certain things mm -hmm. um but uh, i'm working on that and getting better at it uh but it is important to keep the big big picture in mind you yeah. know where do you want to be what do you, how does it fit with your bigger plan um you know do you see a, do you see growing here and i really did want to grow in ontario yeah. and then i had i had to pivot because when i saw what they were doing and what people were accepting as normal i'm like oh there's no future for me here, at least as an investor. You know, even living here, it's, I was, there was a while there where I was pretty confident I was leaving. Yeah. Um, but I'm hopeful that I can, you know, find a way to stay here for now because our family's here and we, you know, we want to raise our son and, you know, grow our family here. Well, I you think know. we all just pay a social tax, right? I have this conversation with my friends. I'm like, I don't, like, I'm, I'm in mortgages. I could literally do this from anywhere. anywhere yeah. Right? And the reason yeah. we, we live in Pickering now and the reason we continue to live in Pickering is because my parents are five minutes down or I guess 10, 15 minute drive. And my in-laws are another 10, 15 minute drive. And my friends are within like a five minute radius. So it's like, yeah, it works perfect. But it's a, it's a social tax that we're paying in, in the form we're of housing, social tax, right? socialist tax yeah. too. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah. That's uh, great for you coming on. I really appreciate yeah. it. Uh, where do people find you? 
Uh, Instagram is probably the best place, M A Y U dot T H A V A. Um, okay. That's honestly the best part. We do have the podcast and stuff like that that you can join in on. Yeah, he's got the uh, podcast with Austin Yeah, yeah. yeah. Rise uh, Network. Rise. Yeah. yeah we have that... events. We've got okay. an event coming up next week, which with this podcast will probably come out yeah, later. Yeah, this will be after <laughs> that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, but we try to have events now and then. It's just be pure, like, like meetups and stuff. Yeah. It's just yeah, pure cool. networking, right? And, and it's nothing like yeah. super organized. We do that too. Yeah. 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 <laughs> awesome. fun. Yeah. All right, man. Well, I appreciate it. For sure. Thank you. There are a lot of people out there talking about the infinite banking strategy and whether or not it makes sense for them. To find out what it's all about and if it's a fit for you, visit controlandcompound.com forward slash Andrew Hines, where my audience can gain exclusive access to books, podcasts, and webinars tailor-made for real estate investors.